Well, our next session, um, we're going to have Diane Kelly, and I took her class yesterday with Ions. <laughs> and I had Feedback. a really good time <laughs> and learning from her. Um, uh, Diane's from IBM, and she's the Executive Security Advisor. And please welcome her for her, our next session. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Shannon. All right, Jerry, you got to leave. <laughs> Uh, hi, everybody. Thanks for, thanks for being here. I know we're right before lunch, so um, I, I'm not going to run over. Do my best to keep this brisk and fun and give you some good coverage on how to get to a safer cloud by leveraging the Cloud Security Alliance. How many folks here uh, have been to the Cloud Security Alliance site and have used their, any of the documentation there? A few. Okay, that's great because um, this is going to explain to you what the CSA is. So anybody that hasn't heard of it, hopefully this will really help you to understand what's available. And for those of you that have used it, I hope that there's some tips in here for you to understand a little of the thinking behind it and maybe get a little bit more uh, value from it. So let's start out with what the heck is the CSA other than a bunch of letters strung together? Well, it is, in fact, it stands for the Cloud Security Alliance. And it's a consortium that's trying to bring sense to the cloud. And the reason that I wanted to do this talk is if I had a nickel for every time I was giving a discussion on cloud security and somebody said, what constitutes security in the cloud? What controls do I need? How do I know if my cloud security provider is, is doing the right thing? How do I know if I'm doing the right thing? Right. I mean, have you ever asked that? Been asked that? So where do you go? Where do you look for it? That's, that's what the CSA was, was created for, was to help try and answer that question, bring together a bunch of smart folks to, to have best practices or at least guidance. Anybody here anti-best practice as a phrase? I used to work at Burton Group. I, I ran the security and risk management team. They're now a part of Gartner. And we had a fellow on the, the, the faculty, Fred Cohen who is the man who, when he was in graduate school, came up with the term computer virus. And he was very against, uh, one of the people that was against, we were, is it best practice? What, what constitutes best? So if you twig on the best practice, I can appreciate that and understand. But let's really look at this around guidance and things that are good ways to approach. Best is going to be a little bit relative to your organization. Is the best thing for your company the best thing for my company necessarily? Not necessarily, right? So again, the, as you're looking, as we're going through this, think about that this is an attempt to bring guidance. It's not a this is a thou must. So it's educational and informative. There's really a community kind of vibe. Anybody here part of the Cloud Security Alliance, active on any of the communities. OK, good. Um, community, sense, bringing together different viewpoints, developing this knowledge base. And there's really, it's a great place to go if you have questions. It, to me, is a little bit like OWASP in the sense that it's something everybody, most people have heard of, but haven't really done a nice deep dive into. OWASP is well, much, much more than just the top 10. Right, there's a lot of documentation at OWASP. There's testing guides. There's web go. There are tools. And, and CSA is like that. CSA is a lot more than the guidance or just the cloud controls matrix. It's actually a really good repository to start with and to ask questions like, is your data secure in the cloud? So if you go to the Cloud Security Alliance, you can just go. It's like a magic gate ball. And you say, is my data secure in the cloud? And it'll tell you yes or no. No. I'm kidding. But it can help you actually understand um, some of the questions that you need to ask. Anybody want to take a, a, a pass at defining what cloud is? It's so clear. Right. It's the cloud, yeah. Someone in the, the cloud security talk yesterday, the, the class, said, um, said something on the lines of, like, it's not magic. And the, you know, it, it can be very confusing. So this is the NIST definition of cloud. If you are ever in a situation where somebody wants you to define cloud and you need to, to have a good support for what it is, then NIST, is, they have a really good baseline. NIST actually has spelled this out. It's, ver it's in words. It's not just this graphic. The graphic was layered on top of it by the Cloud Security Alliance. And it shows the different kinds of 
characteristics of the cloud itself. So the elasticity for the bursting, the fact that it's on demand, that it's very often self-service, that you measure, you pay for it as you go. And then a really critical one for security, what happens most of the time to give you all that great elasticity and manage, manageability and self-service and, and pay? Is that, that resource pooling, so bringing together all of those resources. And that's one of the, the things that goes on. And then the, the, the service models. And I'm actually surprised how often even these days when I'm talking to an organization and there's confusion about what infrastructure as a service or platform as a service or software as a service. I asked PaaS and SaaS. The difference between those and also what that, how that impacts your security and your trust. Where do you have, anybody want to tell me, which, which one of these models, IaaS, PaaS, or SaaS, that you as a customer who's putting data workloads and resources into the cloud, which one of these models, in general, do you have the most control over, the security of? The most control. I'm not saying you have complete control, but the, which one do you think you have the most control over? Anyone? Huh? Infrastructure. Yes. Infrastructure. Um, and again, you have to look at every single instance to make sure that, but in general, infrastructure, because that's often very much the bare metal. So you're putting the operating system on top of that, and then you can configure or orchestrate that operating system, put your controls and policies in place. When you get up into the platform, there are certain things the platform itself is provided by your cloud provider. So it could be just a bunch of, of operating systems that are running on VMs that burst up as you need them. It could be a development platform like a Heroku, for example. But then some of the things on the underlying operating system and management may be out of your control. And then when you get up to software as a service, you in general have the absolute least amount of control. And that's because everything underneath that software application belongs to the cloud provider and is managed by them. And this is really meaningful and, and has impact when you look at the CSA uh, descriptions and assessments of security because when you say, is my data secure in the cloud, you also have to answer some of these questions because your ability to secure it or manage it in the cloud is going to matter based on which kind of model you're actually using. And this often gets, gets lost, but it's a really critical point. And then ultimately, the deployment models themselves, public, private, hybrid, and community. And you're, again, your security and the is my data secure, <laughs> is my service secure, is going to matter too based on whether it's a public cloud, a private cloud, or if it's a hybrid of both of those. So just a little bit of, of level set here on the cloud. And again, if you do get into a situation where you're struggling to define cloud, or anybody ever been in an argument with somebody about you know, what IaaS means or what cloud means? I've been in some meetings where it can get kind of... A little squirrely. So if you do, I, I would just, I would recommend, I really think that both the CSA graphic here and then the underlying uh, explanation from the NIST, uh, the NIST publication, I think it's, a, it's special, pub, 845, um, the NIST special publication are really useful. So I'm going to be focusing very much on the CSA, so why am I bringing up these other, folk, uh, other references? because I think that they are important and I really don't want to completely leave them off. So NIST is one uh, reference for you, uh, one that's not up here because I believe you have to be a member of ISACA, but ISACA has recently put out the COBIT folks. If you're a COBIT fan, the ISACA organization has recently published cloud controls uh, mapped to and supported by COBIT 5. So if you do, if you are a COBIT shop, um, that's a, a really good resource, that book that they put out recently. And then also the, Fed, the U.S. federal government has FedRAMP, which is, was used and put in place for federal entities and agencies that were saying, is my data going to be secure in the cloud? Can I go to the cloud? Is this all right? FedRAMP is a way to have a normalized assessment of a cloud security provider. So I've got the, the link that you can actually look at the documentation from the U.S. federal government that, that can be helpful. And then... PCI has its own, so PCI is the uh, payment card industry. They're the folks that gave us the data security standard. <laughs> Yay. Uh, so the Security Standards Council, guess where all of the emerging technology goes in the payment card uh, world? Is it in DSS 3.0? Anybody here have to, have to uh, attest, assert to, uh, to, to PCI 3.0? 
No? Nobody stores processes and transmits credit cards at your company. No? All right. Um, so if you do have to, to adhere to PCI, if you look at the DSS and 3.0, some of you weren't, weren't raising your hand, so I know you have to do uh, if you If you look at the DSS, um, it doesn't have a lot about cloud and virtualization. Most of emerging technologies in the PCI world come out in these things that are these special publications. And that's where a lot of the guidance about cloud is. So if you do have to adhere to PCI or you're just interested in what the Security Standards Council's thoughts are on best practices and guidance, that is another really good resource for you. The link is there. And again, this is a freely available resource. Now on to our actual CSA documents. Uh, so what's at the CSA? They've split what's available at the Cloud Security Alliance into three different big groups. The first one is education. So there's training, and you can get certification on being a, basically a cloud security ninja. They also have white papers that help you understand uh, what different points of you know, cloud security, different aspects that you need to take a look at. I'm proud to say that one of the papers that I wrote is actually up at, was, was deemed good enough to go into the knowledge base at the CSA. So you get white papers written by different, different uh, thought leaders in the industry about different aspects of cloud security to help you understand what you might want to think about. And then there are two different uh, key certifications that at that certificate of cloud security knowledge that I, I mentioned so that you can become the expert at your organization, whether you're going to do assessments for your organization or architecture for your organization. And then also the, the STAR. Anybody here using the STAR or have work at a company that is in the STAR? Yes. OK. <laughs> Who's that? What, what company? OK. All right, so the, the STAR, this is some pretty cool stuff. It's the Security Trust and Assurance Registry. Again, it's free for you to go and take a look at it. And the STAR, we're going to do a little bit of a deep dive in a bit on it. But it's a way for you to understand what your cloud security providers are doing. And it started out with a fairly light self-attestation, and they're moving it and maturing it into a, a pretty cool concept of a continuous ongoing monitoring. So if you are contracting with a cloud security provider and you want to get some sense of what they're doing from a security perspective, the STAR could be a really, is a really, really good place to, to start. And then they have standards. They have this documentation that is actual standard guidance on those good practices, best practices to implement. Um, if you look at the research, you'll notice I've got, I've got a short list here. Didn't want to give you the, the whole bore everybody with it, but I wanted to give you an idea of when I said that there are really interesting white papers on unique aspects of cloud security, what that meant. So that means looking at big data analytics and how that might impact security overall. We had a discussion yesterday about big data and some of the unintended consequences. Has anybody looked at what happens when you overlap seemingly innocuous pieces of data and how that might create a privacy or a security risk? So this is really, the, they, they start to, you can start looking at things that if you haven't thought about that, there are things that, you know, white papers where there's uh, thinking around some of these emerging problems or emerging security challenges in the cloud space. And the big data analytics, sort of the most famous example of things that seem innocuous, but when you bring it all together, uh, it could be an invasion of privacy, is probably the, the uh, target example. And I don't mean the, I don't mean that they're the, 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 the one at the December attack on their point of sales with Black Poth. I mean, when the, the uh, girl, the teenage girl's father got a mailer that said that she was pregnant and said, hey, you know, so now that you're pregnant, you know, we, we want to help you with your prenatal vitamins. And it was just a, a, an advertising mailer for Target. Well, Target, their analytics are so good that they can tell based on what you buy whether you're pregnant or not. But she was a teenage girl, had not told her parents yet. So this is just one example of sometimes these are unintended security consequences that we have in the big data world. Um, consensus assessment initiative I'm going to be talking about. That is uh, what's affectionately known as the CAKE. Uh, the mobile space and what you need to think about for security and mobile, and then also this open certification framework. 
So my, so, so we're going to go into, we're going to spend the rest of the day and we're going to read through every single document. No, you guys don't want to do that. Right? So we don't have, an, we have an hour here. I'm hoping in this hour that, that I can share with you and get you excited about the kinds of, of, of good resources that are in, in the Cloud Security Alliance repository. But we're going to focus on three, and these are the three that are my favorites. And the reason that they're my favorites is that when I work with customers, and with organizations, these are the ones that have proven to have the most value. So I'm hoping that by sharing them with you, you'll be able to get some good, good value and guidance out of them. So the first one is the Security Guidance 3.0. Anybody here using that at your company? Reddit? No? A couple. All right. Anybody here responsible for cloud security or have, have input into what your, your company is doing for cloud security? If you do. If you are assessing it, doing architecture, building to it, anything related to cloud security, assessing whether you want to have a partnership with somebody in the, go and read this document. The nice thing about this document is that it's fairly easily written. I love the NIST special publications, but you, sometimes they get a little long and a little bit in the weeds, and it can be a little bit, a little bit of a challenge, or uh, uh, there was the, the, the state of the art on a software assurance a while ago, and, and I remember that document. It took me weeks to get through it. This is not one of those documents. This is actually a very readable document. Uh, it, it has different authors, so if you don't like the tone of one chapter, the kind of cool thing is you're going to get a different author in the next chapter, so, or a different set of authors, and it's got a lot of graphics in it. So it's actually very, very readable and very, uh, very well laid out. So they started out with this community document, and they got it to a, a pretty stable baseline, and then they're up at, at version three right now, which has given it some nice uh, a level of, of sort of structural secure, of, uh, maturity. And they started to sync it up with looking at, at the different multinational standards because we know we're not, especially we're not just an, uh, you know, unto ourselves in the United States. But the other really important thing is that in cloud, what happens to our, what's one of the big security impacts in our data in cloud? It goes all over the place, right? The data centers are geolocated all over the world. So your data may not be residing in the US and in fact, and this is something, if you haven't looked into this, in fact, if you need your data to reside in the United States all the time, you should talk to your cloud security provider because there's a very strong chance that it does not stay in the United States all the time. So looking at these multinational standards and how that may impact data because the different data rules and privacy rules really matter based on geolocation. Anyone here work with a company that's Canadian? Headquartered in Canada. So how would you feel? If you, did you know that a lot of Canadian companies won't put their data in United States data centers? Because they don't trust us. So just as we don't always trust the other countries and their rules, it, it's just you get accustomed to the rules in the country that you're in. It's not that one set is right or one set is wrong, but they differ by country and you need to understand those, those differences. And the Canadians have different levels of privacy laws than we do in the United States. So um, they understand our, our laws. and In some cases, companies will opt out of working with a, an organization, cloud, security, uh, cloud service provider, that can't assure that their, their data won't ever reside in the United States. And then the other thing that this does is it takes in uh, the different information that the, the working groups have learned from the different initiatives going on at the Cloud Security Alliance. So again, trying to make this community-based and very much looking at it being a best practice. So I think it's a great document. As I said, if you haven't read it and you've got anything related to cloud at your company, please take a few moments after this, this meeting. And, and uh, I know, in your copious spare time, because none of us have any spare time, but take, take, a chance, take a, a, some time to read it. However, here's what it can't do. It can't make a risk decision for you. It won't tell you if something is secure or not. It's not going to do the classification for your data. You need to make those decisions yourself. You need to make the ultimate risk decision for your company. Anybody sit on the board of directors at your organization and know what your overall risk appetite is to IT or cybersecurity decisions? No, nah, I mean, you know, a lot of security folks, we don't, 
I've only ever been called into a boardroom when something went wrong. So nobody ever brought me in as a, hey, we'd like, really like your opinion on the, 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 the risk appetite. But risk is going to be specific to each organization, and you have to make your own decisions. So what this, the, the guidance is good for is to help inform you of the things that you need to look at and assess it's not going to make a final yes or no, you should go to the cloud or you shouldn't. So don't look at it like it's, it's going to be able to, to solve that. Um, uh, as things change, anybody here know about the executive order from Obama last year and what that is now? The cybersecurity executive order that came from the, the president. A little bit? Does anybody want to take a... I wish I had, I had a book I gave away yesterday. Anybody want to take a guess at, at what this is, what it became in February? NIST. Yes, yeah, somebody said it. It's the NIST Critical Infrastructure Cybersecurity Framework, which is currently voluntary, but if you read the tea leaves, it appears that many of the organizations in the United States may find that it's not as voluntary as all that going forward. And you may say, well, I'm not critical infrastructure. I'm not a nuclear energy plant. We're a bank. Bank's critical infrastructure. <laughs> We're healthcare, critical infrastructure. So this stuff is, is really meaningful. And, and this new framework that comes out, it's got five processes that are identified, I think is going to change how a lot of us implement our security programs and how we even assess how we interact with, with partners and providers like cloud service providers. So the CSA 3.0 was published before the NIST Cybersecurity Critical Infrastructure Framework. So you're not going to find that in there. I think it was published before 3.0 of PCI. You're not going to find that in there. So that's another thing as you're reading through this, the, the standard to understand that you know, they don't have all the answers to the things that have just come out automatically. And they don't, they don't know all of the different geo requirements. They lay out that there are geographical requirements, but they don't actually tell you all of them. So these are things you're going to have to sit down with your legal team to decide. So it's really what it is. It's a decision tool. It will help you understand how to make decisions about going into the cloud. Yeah, did somebody think, Scott? So these are the different segments. Of, I hope that's readable. Um, these are the different segments that are contained within the guidance, and they're broken down into various domains. I'm not going to go through every single domain. Again, I wanted you to just understand the level, the depth that is in this document. And each one of these are in chapters. And you could dip into a chapter as you need. So you may not be that interested in, for example, traditional security, business continuity, and, and disaster. But you may be really, really interested in application security. Right. We had White Hat in here speaking right before me, right? Application security experts. That may be what you're interested in. So you can you know, pick and choose. If you don't want to read the entire thing, you can pick just what's the most important to you. When they start out, the first thing in the guidance that is recommended in this, and I, I think I, I really do appreciate this, is to take, make an understanding of the asset and determining its importance. So what's an asset? An asset is something that you, know, you can have a data, a function, or an application, because the cloud can contain all of that. Right? You could be going to the cloud just for a function. What would a function be? Eh, maybe I, I do my mail, my mail hygiene out in the cloud. That's what I use the cloud for. Maybe I have federated identity provider. So this is a, you know, a, a function. Maybe I'm using Salesforce. So I'm using a specific application or Office 365, a suite of applications. Maybe I'm just putting a bunch of data up in the cloud. So taking a look at these different impacts, defining the asset, and then understanding you know, how important it is to you. And how do you figure out how important it is? Well, what happens when things go south? So what's the harm if you lose CI or A, or CIA or A is impacted? Anybody here know what CIA stands for? Yes? OK. Yeah? Confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Yay, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Yeah, so, so what if, if, you, if you lose the confidentiality or the integrity? And this, you know, this stuff, it may seem like, well, we know this. You know what? 
I have never gone into a large organization where they've actually sat down and done this and defined it. This isn't something that you can just say we get it back of envelope because I guarantee you, you're forgetting some of the data that's going up there. You don't understand all of the, the functions that you're interacting with and you may not have assessed the real impact from the CIA harm when you put something out into the cloud. I have heard a lot of times, well, we don't care about that backup that's going into the cloud because it's just brochureware or it's just coming out of our press team and, you know, that's fine. It's just press releases. Well, a press release from a publicly traded company prior to it being approved to be available, that's really sensitive data. What about just the name of your company? It's just brochureware. It's the name of your company and it's your product. What if I got in and I changed that? What if I changed, for example, what if I got a hold of an IBM, you know, an IBM brochure and I changed it to HAL? <laughs> so, you know, calling out to, to the, the Space Odyssey 2001, the negative, the, the negative computer. Or I guess, any Mad Men fans here? Yeah, so. I, the IBM 360 drove one of the, the characters crazy last week. Uh, so I don't know, that's sort of like, you know, good news, bad news on that one. Um, but so, so looking at, if somebody did get into to one of our marketing documents and changed it to how, right? So you, we may think that isn't that valuable, but it very well can be. So again, like I said, you know, we, we often think, well, we've done this or we know it intuitively, and that's not always the case. So has anybody looked at multi-tenancy and how that impacts your security in the cloud? Okay, this is a really critical one and I love that they call this out in the guidance and I, I did want to bring it up because it's very often misunderstood. Let's say we've got a hypervisor. First of all, the admin that has the ability to admin the hypervisor, what do they have complete control of? Every VM instance on top of the hypervisor. It's basically root. So one thing is you really care about the personnel at the cloud service provider because if your VMs are running on top of that hypervisor, you want to make sure that you trust the personnel. Okay, and they have access to, to manage the hypervisor. What else, if we've, got, if we've got VMs on the same hypervisor and they're at different sensitivity levels, what's the overall sensitivity level of that, enti of that entire system? The vulnerability is going to be at the lowest one because the VM that's the least protected, that's what you've got for security across the entire system. The one that's got the highest sensitivity is going to be the sensitivity level for all of the VMs. And this is very often misunderstood and it's a really critical point because that means that when you're sharing, and this goes back to that shared resources, when you're sharing a VM, with applications and others that are at a lower security or sensitivity level, you've got a mismatch. How many times do you know if your vendor is moving a new VM on, bringing up a new application for one of your, your, your partners maybe, right? Do you know exactly what's going on on all the VMs that you're using the hypervisor? Probably not, most of us don't, right? So, so that, that actually, that's gonna impact your security. That, so that, there's an explanation about that. What else happens in shared resources? What did we scrape back to Target? I don't mean to pick on Target, but what, what, what did they scrape in, in Target to get the, the information? They scraped the RAM, right? They were looking at what was going on in the RAM. So what's being shared if you're on a, if, you're, if you've all got the same hardware? Your RAM is gonna be shared in most cases too. So again, changing the security model, upping the, the, um, the ante and, and creating in multi-tenancy spaces a different security type model that you need to take a look at and understand. Because again, that question, is my data secure? You need to answer a lot of questions to be able to say if it is or it isn't. And once you understand the basics of cloud security using the guidance, they go into an architectural model. So starting with the, the different architectural way that you can deploy out into the cloud. So the public and the private and the community, and then explaining the different security assessment models that you, you can take a look at as you're, you're going through the deployment. And then they also build out, which I think is actually pretty nice, talking about who manages and owns what. And this goes back to, we were talking about a little bit earlier, this infrastructure 
platform software as a service and how our trust levels change. They change based on what level of control you have, who the owner and who the manager is. So this guidance actually walks you through some of that and helps you understand, you know, is it a trusted or untrusted? And ultimately on the hybrid, we've got both trusted and trusted. Private, you know, we landed on trusted, although you have to make sure that you, you've checked all the, dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's to really get to trusted. All right, another domain that I think is really of use is the data security because they approach this as a data security life cycle. What do we often forget when we're looking? Well, first of all, anybody here ever done a full data map of all the sensitive data at your organization? You're working on it. And how long have you been working on it? All right, th thank you. So this gentleman here said that his organization is working on it and they've been working on it a couple of years. This is how it goes. It, you get a lot of people not working on it at all because it's a nightmare. But when you actually do start to work on it, a couple of years is, a, you know, it, it takes a very long time. Well, that's back when we were looking at where our data went on-prem and the life cycle of our data on-prem. Guess what makes it 20,000 times harder? Going into the cloud, going on all the BYOD, going on to all the mobile devices. So your data lifecycle and mapping is really, really important. Is again, as you ask that question, is my data secure? Where did it originate? Where did it go? And then a big one, what do you do to get rid of your data? I, I worked for KPMG for a few years, and KPMG had the strongest spoliation policy of a company that I, I believe I've ever worked for because anything that was in our mailbox at the time I worked there at 90 days was blown away. That was it. We got rid of it. Why? Why? This is before all the stuff happened at Anderson, but you know, there's actually a benefit to deleting data, right? Sometimes you delete information in that, that trail that you didn't want to be there. But that was it. 90 days, everything in the email was gone. This didn't mean we didn't have to have all of our audit level work papers. That's a completely different topic. And you need to be complete. I, I, you, there's preservation related to audit and work paper documents. So this is not anything that was related to a work paper. This was email. But the email, that data was at 90 days gone. What about other data? What about data that you've backed up and you shipped off to Iron Mountain, for example? How do you manage that? Who's monitoring that? Does anybody have a key lifecycle management policy where you have to change keys, for example, every year? Do you go back to all of your backup encrypted tapes and you change the keys on those and re-encrypt them from four years ago? Probably, think about all this because this is all now moving into the cloud and destroy is a very, very important component of it. So that, again, the, the, the guidance is going to walk you through specifically the cloud, um, the things you need to assess as you're working with a cloud provider. And then encryption and key management. This is, all a really, re this is also a really, really important one in the cloud because what's the only way to guarantee that your data in the cloud will be accessible to nobody but you? Other than that, you don't put it there. I mean, that's one, three, okay, don't put it. Manage keys. Thank you, yes. Encrypt it yourself, hold on to the private key, and then send it up to the cloud. That's it, that's the only way. Now, you may not want to do that for all of your data. You may have a different use case, and as again, remember risk is gonna be relative, and you have to make risk decisions, right? So your risk decision may be a little bit different. You may say, it's okay if my provider has the key, or it's okay if the NSA has the key. I don't know what your requirements are specifically, but uh, for encryption, if you want to make sure you're the only entity that can view that data, you need to hold on to the key itself. And as you're looking at different ways to, to actually uh, protect your data, some of the models that are available are whether it's content to wear, or format preserving. Format preserving is really useful if you need to continue to work with other legacy systems, for example. So let's say you're an educational institution and you have a system that uses social security numbers or used to use social security numbers as a, 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 um, as a, a, 
a, a, an ID for the people, for the, the, the students at your school. And I say this because I went to Boston College and Boston College a few years ago lost everybody's social security numbers that were in my, my year and when I was going to college because it was in fact my student ID and they wrote me a little letter like, we're really sorry, but it's out there. Um, but so, so you've changed, you know, now you, you want to be able to, your system has to use social security numbers, but you don't, and as you give out new student IDs, you give out things that look like social security numbers but aren't, but you still have this issue of how do I deal with all the legacy people that had a social security number? So you would do something like a format preserving uh, protection, like format preserving uh, data masking, where it looks like the social security number, but it isn't a social security, or it looks like a telephone. Another good use case on, on uh, format preserving and, and data masking is um, when you've got a federated cloud environment, where you've got levels of, of uh, access and hierarchical control that need to be used. So let's say you're United Airlines. United Airlines know a lot about you. They often know your birthday. They know your, your, your known traveler number if you're part of the TSA program or you're a global entry traveler. They know your gender. Right? They know a lot about you. But the service rep that's helping you move your, your seat from a middle seat to an aisle, does that service rep need to know everything? Probably not. But they might want to see that that data is in there and has gone through. So you can either mask it um, and have it just be completely masked or anonymized or format preserved. So these are some options. The other thing you can use putting your information up into the cloud to protect it is to tokenize it. So you just give it a partial representation, but it's unusable. This is very often used in credit cards, although apparently we don't have a lot of credit card PCI folks here. Um, but very often you'll see tokenization used there. And then you can also take a look at the database control. So I, just a real quick note on key management. This puts people to sleep, this topic, because, I mean, really, right? That's why I didn't even put anything up there with a picture, because I, I, I get it. You say key management and people go, but it is one of the most important things you can do to protect your information, especially when you're going up into the cloud. And I'm a really strong proponent on looking at interoperability between key management protocols, because as we put more and more data in the cloud and it's moving from this partner to that partner, uh, we're going to have to have a way to manage and federate these keys in a secure way. So looking at, 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 um, at uh, programs like the OASIS group is working on KMIP, the Key Management Interoperability Protocol, strongly advise you that if you're looking at an encryption vendor to help you encrypt or protect your data before it goes to the cloud, or if you're talking to your cloud security provider about what they're doing uh, for encryption and data protection in the cloud, that you also have the key management conversation. If you don't want to have the key management conversation, find some crypto guy at your, at your, uh, your company, crypto geek, I didn't mean to be gender specific there, um, but find a crypto person and have them have that conversation. Somebody's got to have that conversation. Or there's, a, uh, there's a, another faculty member at IONS whose name is Randy Sabet. He's a former NSA cryptographer, and now he's a lawyer. So he would be a great person to have that conversation around key management. All right, so that's the, that's the guidance. That was a real high-level overview. And I tried to give you some, some highlights into some of the more interesting points that I, I found in there. But again, please, I hope that that got you excited about the guidance to go read it because it really is, it's a really fantastic resource. But guidance is guidance, and some of us just want to know, I don't want to read all the guidance, I don't want to think about it, I don't want to worry about risk assessment, just tell me what to do. Tell me what my provider does. And that's actually where the cloud controls matrix comes in. Because this is a, it's a spreadsheet. It's a big, huge list of controls that your provider, or you as you go into the cloud, or your provider's supply chain provider, can implement to help answer that question, is my data secure? This one has, uh, so interesting, the cloud controls matrix and the, the guidance haven't been completely in sync. So we've got a few extra domains because the cloud controls matrix is a little bit newer than the, the guidance itself. So we've got 16 domains and 136 controls in there. And then this is the very, very cool thing. They call it um, crosswalks. I would call it mapping, but in CSA parlance, it's crosswalks. So a crosswalk is if you have to be compliant with NIST or with HIPAA or with PCI or with NERC, they've done the mapping to the controls and the control matrix to the appropriate section of those 
um, those different frameworks. Also, you know, 853, for example, ISO, 27,000. So if you are looking at this, they've done the hard work of figuring out what maps to, to what. So this is really valuable. Anybody here uh, use the Unified Contro uh, Compliance Framework, the UCF? Yes. Okay, so you, you know the value of having something that does that mapping for you. So they've got that here in the, the control matrix. So here are our 16 domains. Again, I'm not going to walk you through all 16 of the domains, but I did want to show you how the actual, the, when I said it was a spreadsheet, I wasn't kidding. Um, they've got the, the spreadsheet maps, crosswalks to specifically uh, if you're at the, the physical, the network, where the architectural relevance, talking about as you do the architecture originally, um, and then which model it applies to, whether it's SAS, PASS, or IAS. So as you're struggling with all of these questions about, you know, does this control or does encryption matter for SAS or IAS, they've done, should I use two-factor authentication? Is that a useful control? They've done all of this work for you, and it's free. So at least take a look at it. And then here again, as I was uh, pointing out to you, this is, the, this is that crosswalk. They don't just say, does this have HIPAA applicability? They'll tell you which part of HIPAA a particular control maps to. So I think that's pretty cool stuff. But anyway, uh, so, if you, so that's, that's, the, that's, I think, a really pretty big win. So how does the matrix, how does the cloud control matrix and the guidance, how do they map to each other? Um, if you're a 27,001 kind of person and you also know what 27,002 from ISO is, I would say that it's very similar there in that the guidance is really more about the program and about how to implement the program. So 27,001 is about ISMs, security management systems, and how to, the processes around them. 27,002 is the specific controls. We have two-factor authentication. We have privileged identity management, for example. And that's really a similar way to think of the guidance from the alliance up to the actual controls matrix that do that specific. So here we've got, you know, you've got domain four is compliance and audit, but then the, com the controls matrix gets very specific. Have you done the audit planning? Have you done the documentation? So they get very specific about what you do and take it down from that really kind of high level conceptual and then how you do the regulatory mapping. All right. You guys are ready for lunch, I can tell. <laughs> Almost. So just the last one, and sort of the best for last, this is the STAR registry, the Trust and Assurance Registry. And this is a, a, a list. Again, you can just go up to the CSA and get it for free. It's a, a registry that tells you what your providers are doing for security. So if you want to know, Amazon, what are you actually doing? And Amazon says, well, you know, we've got the SSAE, SOC 2, <laughs> we're good, we're, we're HIPAA compliant. Uh, this actually takes them down to a different level. And what do you think you use to attest into the STAR registry? What did they go through to get into the STAR registry? That's CCM. They have to fill it all out and say if they've actually done the CCM, the cloud controls matrix, the provider fills that out. The other thing that they may fill out is this uh, uh, consensus assessment questionnaire, the CAKE, which normalizes questions around what they're doing for security. But that's how you get into this registry, is that you, you either you go in and you self-attest by filling out either the CAKE or the CCM, and then you put it up there. And now you can go in and you can see the provider's controls matrix. So if you looked at that matrix and you thought, uh-uh, I don't want to fill that out. Okay, I get it. Not a lot of companies. But if you want your provider to fill it out so that you don't have to ask them all the questions that you need to, so that you don't have to ask them questions that they've already answered. Um, another thing that, and I don't mean to, don't ask them any questions. Another thing that I think is really useful about looking at how they filled these out is that you can take a look at both the CAKE and the CCM. There, I guarantee you there's a control in there that isn't mentioned that your company, Matt, really cares about. So the nice thing is that as you look at what controls there are, it's going to give you ideas about things that haven't been covered. Anybody do a lot of writing? There's a saying, you know, it's, it's a whole lot easier to edit something than it is to write from scratch. And that's one of the great things about the CCM is that it really does help you go from, you know, it, it, you can edit it rather than going from scratch. So taking a look at what the provider has written down and writing your list of, you know what, 
this wasn't this was this control hasn't been answered in full how they're doing it or as I look at that they've got data spoliation and data destruction at the end of the life cycle I actually want to ask them some specific questions about how they're doing that so that's the that's kind of a cool thing about this then there's also just going out to full certification so there has been this self-attestation that's where the start really started but they're moving into different kinds of certifications this is a third-party assessment of the provider they're basing it around ISO 27000 so if you are an ISO 27000 uh, person um, and the cloud controls matrix and then right now they've got this dual option where you can actually be certified to different versions of the oh we've got lunch coming in okay hey, it's the end of the cloud controls matrix talk. <laughs> so you can be dual certified to the cloud controls matrix of 1.5 or 3.0. It matters. There are different sets of controls, so you want to make sure that you talk to your vendor about which one they're certifying against. As of March of next year, it's going to be 3.0 only. Um, uh, the attestation is, is based on the SOC Type 2, which is the SSAE, the new SAS 70 and looking at additional attestation uh, criteria from there, from the CCM. So again, if you're talking to your vendor and they say, hey, I'm, I'm SSAE, I'm good, you can say, hey, I want you to also look at the cloud controls matrix because SSAE wasn't cloud specific. I want you to inform it with the controls from the cloud controls matrix. So that's going to give you a lot better view into the attestation and the is my data secure with that provider. And then this last one, this is pretty cool. It's a little bit out there. It's not ready yet. It's still under development. But this is going to be continuous ongoing monitoring of your cloud provider so that you can assure and you can see their security state. And this one, I mean, I'm really interested to see how this plays out. But this is, is almost the number one problem that I hear coming back from companies is that they do all this work up front to figure out what the security level of their provider is. They get these beautiful SLAs written, and then they don't know what's going to go on, <coughs> what goes on the next day. Anybody ever done an audit, right? An auditor will tell you. I told people this all the time when I was doing them. Here's the, here's the picture. Here's the snapshot of your network right this second. And when the second that you make a change, the second you add a new device, anything, my audit is pretty much you know, off the table at some level because I don't know how of all those dependencies are going to interact. So you can only audit to that snapshot in time. And that's just the way that it is. You may have a good sense of how adding something may change the audit, but that audit is, is up to that snapshot in time. That's what this continuous monitoring is really going to be cool for, I think, because it's a very dynamic environment in the cloud. Your provider is very dynamic. And having continuous auditing will really help you to to understand how they're changing over time. So how would you actually put this into to use? Take a look at the guidance. You probably figured this out from what I said, but take a look at the guidance. Then figure out for yourselves the importance, what you're going to put in there. Remember the data, the applications, or the functions. You figure out what you're going to put into the cloud and the importance if any harm goes wrong, that CIA question. So do that next. And then figure out what you feel comfortable putting in the cloud. After that, I would recommend that you go through the CCM or the CAKE yourselves to figure out what's in there that your company really cares about, how it's going to impact putting that data or that application or function in the cloud, and anything that wasn't in there that your company wants a deeper dive on or wants to have additional information about. Start out with checking to see if the provider that you're going to work with is in the STAR registry, because if they are, great. You can do some of the homework already, seeing and you know, see if they're self-attest or if you want them to have the third-party certification. And then, now you've got all the information to be able to address the gaps before you go to contract. This is going to make that contract negotiation a whole lot easier if you take this path. So that was really all I had to say. I know we've got lunch coming in, so I'll let you guys go to lunch. But um, I just wanted to, to let you know that there's, there really is this is a rich set of free resources. They're very, very valuable, and they can, can help you actually save a lot of time, even though that spreadsheet may have looked a little bit off-putting. And then I would also like to have a call to action. If you're doing any security work in the cloud, please get involved with the CSA and, and become one of the next thought leaders that's going to inform how we think about cloud security going forward. And then uh, finally, this is my list of 
different resources that, that I have talked about. So if you want to actually go and look at any of them, they're right there for you. So that's, that's the end of it. I want to thank you so much for your time. And I, if you have questions, please let me know. Um, I, I, I know we've got lunch coming in, so I'm going to cede the floor and let you guys go and get, get your, your, your lunch. But thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>